Welcome to Tax Law GH and welcome to this video on tips that will ensure that you never ever ever feel like tax paper. Before we get into the tips, let's look at the structure of tax exams in general. So tax exams will come in two forms. You have a general tax or the mixed bag papers and then you have your specific or specialist papers. General tax papers will be a type that in one exam will test you on different tax types, employment income taxes, business income taxes, value-added tax or goods and services taxes, and customs, tax administration, inheritance taxes, depending on your country. Then the specific or specialist papers will test you on things that are very specific, like international taxation, or like a paper that focuses specifically on something like oil and gas and mineral taxation. Under specific taxation, you could have both professional programs and academic programs, which could be undergraduate or postgraduate level. Under the general tax or mixed bag papers, you could have your professional exams again. So think about the ACCA, ICA in India, ICA in Ghana. It depends on your country. Whatever professional body you have there could have a specific exam on taxes. Then academic programs also feature a lot more um, general tax papers. So you find bachelor degree and master's degree programs in accounting typically having mixed bag tax papers. Enough of the structure, let's get into the tips. So tip number five that will ensure your success is to have a change in your mindset. What do you need to take away from here? First thing is that learn or begin to realize that tax is essentially law. So tax is law, end of story. Anytime you sit for a tax paper, understand that you are actually studying or writing an exam that is testing you on some principles of law. It's a law paper at the very fundamental level. Based on this, the next point is textbooks are fine, but be careful. Are the textbooks up to date? For example, if you are sitting on an exam in 2021, it's very deadly to try to use a textbook from 2017, 2018 or 2019 because tax laws are, di are dynamic. They change from time to time. And in almost every territory around the world, when a budget is read, then tax laws or bills are taken to parliament and these are subsequently passed into acts of parliament. And some countries choose to call these finance acts. Some do a straight away um, amendment act to the main act. Point I'm making here is textbooks are fine as long as you're using the most up-to-date version. And then how relevant are textbooks in practice? In practice, if you are a tax consultant, you will most likely be using the tax laws themselves as opposed to textbooks. Don't forget textbooks are someone's interpretation of the law with just a few more exam questions here and there. So remember, the law is supreme. Then the paper is testing just one thing. The tax exam paper is testing just one thing, which is your knowledge of some law, some agreement, some document somewhere. So if it's a paper on direct taxation, then they are testing your law or your knowledge of the law on income taxes in your particular country. If it's a tax question on VAT or value added tax or goods and services taxes, it's testing your knowledge of a specific tax, that, a specific law that will govern value added tax in your territory. If it's a paper on international taxation, then it's probably testing your knowledge of double taxation agreement, either the OECD double tax agreement or the UN tax model um, convention. Then tax is relevant. Very important to mention this. It's arguably the most relevant subject you're studying because you can immediately apply tax in your day-to-day -day life. When you study VAT, when you study goods and services taxes, when you study inheritance tax, when you study um, business income taxation, all of these are things you can apply in your life. They are right in front of you. So these are things you need to change when it comes to your mindset about approaching the study of taxation. Then why not mention this? Believe in yourself. Because why not? There's a popular saying that goes like, whether you think you can or you think you can't, Either way, you are right. So believe in yourself, believe you are capable, believe you will be successful in your exam and you are halfway there. Let's go to number four, which is really past exam papers are your best friend. What do I mean here? Obtain the past five years of whatever exam you are sitting. So look for the past five years. And I don't mean past five exam sittings. I mean 
past years so not the exam sessions but the full year and when you get these past five years what you are what are you required to do establish the scope or coverage what are the topics that have been frequently tested in these exams your purpose here really is to ensure that you are trying to see what has the examiner consistently tested over the past period once you do this then you are required to now compare this to the exam syllabus so with your current syllabus that governs what will be tested on exam day when you are ready to write your exam how much of the syllabus has been tested what are the frequently appearing areas and where do you need to focus a lot more of your attention on and then take note of the trends if you if you can and you have the time you can create an excel spreadsheet and create a table that shows each year and what topic was tested and what question it was it is for you to just develop a trend and then you try to figure out which areas are the most frequently occurring i can guarantee you you will realize there is indeed a trend in tax papers and then practice 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 i cannot emphasize this enough the more you practice past exam questions the higher chances of succeeding the higher chances of passing tax is actually one of the most um, one of the papers that require a lot more practice because the more you practice the more you get used to the principles the concepts the relevant piece of law that governs that particular topic so remember practice 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 analogy i'll give you here is if you don't practice past exam questions it's like reading a book on let's say how to become the best footballer in the world and never actually playing football and expecting to beat ronaldo or messi to the football of the year award so please practice 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 and that is the only way you succeed in your tax exam talking about practice please remember that there will be changes in laws so if you are looking at the past paper from 2017 or 2018 or 2019 ensure that you answer them in light of current year tax changes so do not just read the question and read the answer and then assume that it's right check if there's been a change in law has the rate changed is the rate still 25 percent is the rate still 15 percent ensure that you study your past exam questions with respect to current um, changes in tax law and then please in as much as i'm encouraging you to obtain the past five years do not try to question spot. What do I mean here? Do not try to use this trend as your way to say, okay, this question has not appeared in the past two or three years, so I'm not studying it. You will go on the exam, then you'll be surprised it's there staring at you. So please do not use this to question spot. It is just to help you establish the scope, know what is testable really and what is not too testable. But all times, remember your syllabus is king. The syllabus should guide you and should tell you what you should focus your energies on. Let's now move to number three, which is important. You cannot do without this. Number three is make sure you answer all questions. And it, makes, it might sound obvious, but let me show you something. If Let's assume you have an exam that is um, a paper that has five questions, 20 marks, each giving you 100 marks in total. If you answer all five questions and it mustn't be fully um, correct answers, you attempted all five questions. Your pass mark is 50% because you are going to be marked out of 100, a possible 100, right? So your pass mark is 50. The guy who does not answer one full question and answers four out of five will now need to score 62.5% to have a chance of passing. And here I'm assuming your pass mark is 50% wherever you are watching this video from. So... By not answering one full question, your pass mark is no longer 50%, but now 62.5%. If you do not answer two questions out of five and you do three instead, your pass mark has now increased to 83.3%. This is actually near impossible to achieve. It means you need to score 83% of the three questions you answered to stand a chance of even passing that exam. If you do two questions out of five, your pass mark is now a perfect score. You need to score every single mark out of the two you answered to stand a chance of passing. What am I saying here? Whether your exam is, is in a multiple choice format, whether it's in an, an essay format, in a section A, section B, section C format, whatever the exam format is, remember that 
you are required to answer all questions to stand the chance of passing. The more questions you attempt, whether they are right or wrong, the higher chances of getting the easy marks that come in every single exam. So please answer all questions. You may ask, how do I get this done? Convert all your marks to minutes, and I'll show you how to do this shortly. So based on the length of the paper, the number of hours, convert every single mark on the exam into minutes, and that will guide you on how much time you need to spend on each particular part. When the time is up, please move on. So what I mean here is stick to your time allocation. Do not flout, do not even miss by one minute. If you allocated five minutes to a question and it's time, move on after five minutes. Let's see how this will work. So let's take a typical exam question. Here, you have a full 20 mark question. And in a 20 mark question like this, you can see it's broken up into a number of sub parts. So there's a five marker here. There is a six marker here. There is a four marker here. And then another five marker here. So assuming this paper is a three hour paper, so you have three hours to answer um, this paper that comes with other questions, other four questions, right? So here, out of three hours, you know this would typically give you what? In minutes, this is 180 minutes. It's a paper that has 100 potential marks up for grabs. Pass mark is 50. So let's convert the marks into minutes. How do you do this? Let's find the minutes per mark ratio. So we have 180 minutes to secure what 100 marks. So this will typically give us what 1.8 minutes per mark. So this will be my guiding light. This is what I'll use to establish the time I need to spend on each particular question. So all you're required to do is multiply the 1.8 minutes by each mark. So I multiply five by 1.8 and that gives me five by 1.8 should give me nine minutes. So it means I will spend only nine minutes on this question. That says I should compute capital gains tax. Then for this six marker, six times 1.8 will give me 10.8 minutes. So it means I should spend maximum 11 minutes on this question. That says compute the withholding taxes payable. In this one that is four marks, I multiply by 1.8 and I get 7.2 minutes. So it means I should spend maximum, let's see, yeah, seven minutes and a few seconds on this question. When it's time, I will move on. Then this last five marker will also be nine minutes. So you realize that in total, 20 times 1.8 should give you 36 minutes. So it means I should not spend more than 36 minutes on this particular question. If I do this consistently, I will have the chance of answering every question. You may ask, what if I don't know the answer to it? Within the first minutes or the first half of every question you are doing, you are able to pick up the easy marks. You'll probably be able to define something, write down a certain law, write down a certain rate, write down a certain formula if it applies. So please stick to your timings. It will give you the opportunity to do all the questions on the paper and you increase your chances of passing the exam. Remember this, it's very, very important. Let's move to Point number two, very important as well. Don't ignore the theory or discursive questions. Why am I saying this? They are the majority of the questions anyways. People who are studying for tax, students of tax, tend to focus a lot more on the computational questions because they feel, well, I'm a tax student, I should do the numbers. But if you check past papers, a lot more of the questions are on theory or on the written or discursive elements. So... They will probably be testing your knowledge of something, distinguish between um, withholding taxes and withholding value added tax, write short note on the rules on inheritance tax, um, discuss the rules around capital allowance. So there will be different questions on the discursive element. If your exam is a multiple choice exam, you realize a lot more multiple choice questions will be on theory or concepts as opposed to um, the ones on computational elements. If I'm not exaggerating, that should be a 60-40 ratio in favor of the discursive element. So they're in the majority. Do not ignore them. The next is the computational questions are based on the theory anyways. So if you are computing any tax, if you are computing value-added tax, if you are computing business income tax, employment income tax, 
all the computational things you are doing will be based on the theory, will be based on the concept, will be based on the law. So once you learn the concept, you learn the discursive element, you are ready to do any computational question that comes your way anyways. The third is that they are the easier sources to score high marks. Really, discursive questions, when they ask you to distinguish between um, tax type A and tax type B, or let's say they ask you to write short notes on capital gains tax, or what are the exemptions for VAT, or distinguish between zero-rated VAT supplies and exempt VAT supplies, or what are the rules around importation of goods, you know, whatever they ask you, these are areas of easy marks because you are able to put down something you remember, some concept you have studied, and you do not need to state specifically word for word what is in the law or your textbook, but as long as you remember the keywords, you are able to pick up some easy marks from these type of questions. The next is the examiners can be very specific, and here be careful. This is where you need to pay specific attention to the words used in the question. They can ask you to give two differences or state the four factors. It means there are four factors only. So please, when it comes to the discursive element, when you are studying them, be careful. Read the words carefully and learn specific rules because there are different specific rules for different tax types depending on where you are studying from. Then finally, all taxes are fair game. And this links back to the point I told you about looking at the trend. But still remember that when it comes to the discursive elements, all topics are fair game. They could ask you to do some discursive elements or write some um, something or explain something, give the difference between something and something, but they will all be on potentially different tax types. So every tax type is fair game. Don't think only company income taxes can come under discursive elements. Don't think that only employment income taxes or tax administration can appear under the discursive questions, any topic is indeed fair game. And to number one, answer the question. It may sound obvious, but please respect the rubric. What do I mean here? If it has to do with presentation, let's say the question asks you to write a report to your finance manager or um, in a memo, like focus on the presentation you've been asked to so have you been asked to discuss, to explain in a memo, to prepare a presentation, to write briefing notes? Please focus on the presentation. In a lot of exams, there are marks awarded for presentation. You don't want to miss these marks. Some professional bodies like the ACCA will call this professional marks. Please do not miss out on such easy marks because you fail to look at the presentation format. If it's a memo, ensure that you have your two you have your form, you have the heading or the title of the memo, and you have the body. An introduction, a body, a conclusion will suffice. Apart from presentation, some questions will have specific requirements. Some will say calculate, some will say discuss, some will say explain, some will say differentiate, some will say write short notes on. Whatever the requirement is, please stick to that and that alone. Also, every word matters. In a tax exam, read the question carefully. Are you being asked to compute capital allowance for 2017? Are you being asked to compute the chargeable income for 2019? Are you being asked to compute capital gains tax for the first six months of the year? Please read the requirements carefully because every single word in the question indeed matters. It could make a difference between you missing the whole point and failing. And then don't create your own question. Don't answer what you wish was asked. Answer the exact question that was asked. If you've been asked to compute tax payable, please compute tax payable. If you've been asked to compute accessible income, please end that accessible income. Don't bother applying the rate. Answer the specific question that has been asked. And then there are so many clues in a tax paper. It's actually one of the easiest papers to pass because the examiner, because they know you need to apply a specific rule, a specific provision, they will try to drop so many hints at you. So you need to try and catch these hints. How do you get good at catching the hints? By practicing past exam papers. So you realize that in every question, they'll probably want you to pick up some rules. So they may mention the preamble. Um, Mr. Jones is married with three children. You realize that there, if there's any provision around um, reliefs for persons who are married with children, they are giving you the clue that you need to apply such a relief. Or they can tell you, 
um, ABC Company Limited is VAT registered. So that should tell you that whatever um, answers you are going to give should be from the perspective of the business that is registered for VAT. They could tell you XYZ Company Limited is a manufacturing company. So it means you need to apply the incentives for manufacturing companies. So please, there are so many clues around the paper. Pick them up and score the easy marks. Then there are easy marks in the rubric themselves. So, for example, if the question says, um, list five main points that cover capital gains tax or five main VAT exemptions. In such a question, all you are required to do is look at the number of marks. So if they ask you to mention five exemptions, if the question says it's for five marks, then you know that the examiner expects you to make, let's say, five valid points for five marks. But that's easy. Let's say the question says distinguish between capital gains tax and gift tax. And they just put their five marks. They don't tell you to give five differences. But because it's five marks, you expect it to know that you need to make one valid point per mark. So at least, at a minimum, make five points. If it's a 10 mark question, then please remember you need to make at least 10 distinct valid points to score all of the maximum 10 marks in the question. Then please don't ignore the examiner's report. There are many students who write an exam without reading the examiner's report. It is a source of golden information. The examiner gives you so many tips on what other students did wrong, what they could have done right, and why you shouldn't repeat those mistakes. So read the examiner's report, you pick up so many vital points, he tells you what he doesn't want students to do. And obviously, um, that would be one of the best ways you could prepare for an exam to ensure you succeed. And then answer the exact question asked. Let me mention this again. It's very important, let me repeat it. If the question asks you to explain, please explain. If they ask you to list, don't bother explaining, you have no business explaining. Do the exact thing you've been asked, Look at the number of marks allocated to that question and please let that guide you. So on this note, believe you are capable. Believe you are able to succeed in your exam. Believe, ju just like you say in both, you will win on exam day. Believe that just like Anthony Joshua, you will smash the exam paper like he smashed Nandi Ruiz Jr. here. Believe you are able to succeed. Believe that you are prepared. Believe you are capable. Believe you're the best in the world and believe that on exam day, you will smash that paper, you will come out victorious and then you are capable. So on this note, I wish you all the very best in your exams and um, this has been our video on exam tips. If you love this video, obviously, please don't forget to smash that like button and don't forget to share this video within your entire network. I will catch you in our next video. <music>